But it all starts, we got to have peace with God. We got to be at peace. We're not at war with him anymore. That old trouble, that, that, that's what condemnation does. You're like, you're not at peace. You feel like there's this battle. You feel like God's mad at you or something. Can I tell you God's not mad at you? God is not mad at you. He knows everything you've done, every, the bad thoughts you thought about doing, and he's still not mad at you. He loves you. Who he's mad at is the enemy out there who tries to deceive us and tell us who we're not, if he's mad at anybody. And you know what? He does get angry. It's really awesome to me when I realize all the emotions that humans have, we got them from God. We got them from our daddy. You find our emotions, they're all in the Bible. You're going to find out he got mad, he got sad, he got happy, he got rejoicing, he was jealous over Israel. There's all kinds, it's all the emotions God has. It's not a bad thing. It's what we do with them sometimes it gets bad. That's why he said, you be you angry, but sin not. You can get as mad as you want to because you know there's some things in this world we need to get mad at. I'm mad at the enemy that lies have been told to our young people, been told to us, and I see the people out there that's been led astray and they're wasting their lives and just, I'm like, oh, I'm mad about that. But I'm not mad at them. God is not mad at you. He loves you. He accepts you. He accepts you even when he doesn't accept your behavior. He still accepts me. He loves me enough. Somebody used to say that he, 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 he loves me uh, right where I'm at. But he loves me too much to leave me there. Because if I continue that old stinking thinking or that old behavior, I'm going to destroy myself and my family and everything around me. He's such a long-suffering God. But this, this scripture right here says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. How can I say he's not mad at me? How can I say I'm at peace? Because I've been justified by faith. See, justified means to make justice. It means to bring things in order. There's been a justice done. I'm like, whoa, if I'm getting justice, I'm in trouble. It wasn't that I, aren't we glad he does not give me justice? Actually, he gives me mercy. But he's still a God that demands justice. There will be a payment for the wrong. Everything that happened to you, there's a payment. Every bad deed that was done by you and to you. There's a justification that had to happen that God, he said he justified us by faith. We have peace with God. It starts off having peace with God before I can ever have the peace of God that passes understanding. So we're going to start there. And, and it, I'm, I'm going to, I felt like I just need to read that scripture because we've been talking about not only the year of the king and find out who we are, what that means, but we found out that first of all, before I can know what, uh, who God is and what he wants me to do, I had to find out who I am. I had to find out if he is my father, then I'm his child. I'm all, I had to realize that he loves me. We can get angry at the things our kids do, but we don't throw them out. We don't, we, if we're a good parent at all, we're not abusing our kids. We're not abandoning our kids. A good parent, God, is a good father. He's not like some of our natural fathers or like some of us. He's actually a good father. And so, so he is, he is um, he, we know who we are. We have a good father and we're his children. We've already established that over and over. That's our identity. But number, then after identity, we discover our purpose. And then we had to say last week, we talked about the purpose, why we have kids. We don't have kids, so they'll grow up and mow our grass. And I say that a lot, our our, our or wash our dishes. We actually have kids because we want to throw, have something out of ours that we can love and be loved in return. So our purpose really can be wrapped up in loving him back. Giving and receiving love. It's simple. The purpose is pretty simple. And, and out of that purpose, then we find something that he actually told Adam and Eve in the garden after they were created and they were sent forth. What did he tell them to do? As soon as he, they were his children, they were his creation, he said, now do something. What was it? In the Agar, later he said, he said, go forth. He said, what? Be fruitful and multiply. So it's not just about you, honey. We are to have children. Whether it's in the natural or in the spiritual, we're to be fruitful. Now, first of all, we're to be fruitful. What's some of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. I need that, don't you? First of all, I need to get some fruit on this tree. I need some peace myself. I first need to have peace with God, knowing I, by faith he's mine and I am his, and now I have peace with my God. 
I had to start there. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. I start getting fruit, and I'm fruitful, and now I've got something to offer somebody, and then I've got this big old juicy apple here that's got some seeds in it, and I become Johnny Appleseed. Now, y'all know what he did in, in history? He took those apples, and what did he do? He took the seeds out of them, and then what did he do? He went around planting them. And we have all these apple trees. That by, I don't know if it's really true or not, but I think there really was one in history. I don't know all the stories. But he had a vision of not just eating the fruit, but he had something for a next generation. He wanted to multiply the fruit. A lot of people, it's all about me. See, this is not just all about you. It's also when you really get this, the next thing you want to do is you want to start multiplying. By nature. You start multiplying. Oh, think about this. Out of a love relationship, we can have children. Out of a spiritual relationship with our, with our now we're the bride and he's the groom, what happens? We start having children. Sometimes you have them yourself. Sometimes you adopt them. All these things. But there's something in us that wants us to take care of something, isn't it? I don't care if it's our little dog like Elliot. You just kind of want something to, to pour your love into and receive love and give love. It's a natural, con it's a natural progression. So when you're having to tell people in your church, you need to go do something for God and, you know, everyone reach one and, and we're going to have this thing. You know, I just kind of wonder about that because really by nature you should be, just start having babies. If you got fruit on your tree and Sister Shay gave us this one and it, I've used it many times. She said, we are fruit trees and fruit, you don't see trees running around taking that limb and just throwing fruit at people. You don't see people, the tree, just throwing fruit, and knocking people upside the head with an orange or apple or, or coconut. Good grief. <laughs> no. It stands there and it lets the fruit be known. It's seen. And all of a sudden, people walk by and go, ooh, ooh look at that orange. Oh, my goodness. They want to go over there and just pluck some goodness off of you. Oh, that fruit. They want to pluck some peace off of you. They see you at work and they just want to, there's some goodness off of you. There's something that draws people. You don't have to run around telling me, I'm a Christian. You, my life should say I'm following Christ. My life should say I'm one of the anointed ones. It's a natural progression that all of a sudden, not only we have identity and we have purpose, but now I have mission. It should start coming out of me. And I had somebody say this week, like, you know, I, I'm just still struggling. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't I just can't find my destiny. I'm like, Wait a minute. See, we got this thing about mission. It's like some destiny. Oh, you know, when I graduate from this and I've got this done, I've got my ducks in a row. I don't know what that means. But whatever it means, when everything happens in one day, I found my call. Let me tell you something. You're called right now in this house. It might be to shake somebody's hand. It might be smile at somebody. It might be telling somebody, you want to, come on, we'll go talk at Costa together today. I don't really know you well. You've been coming in and out of church. Would you just come hang out with me? Let me tell you, this is the purpose. It's not the there. It's the journey. It's every day this stuff starts coming out of me. But it starts somewhere. Man, I'm going somewhere. I didn't even plan to go, but that's, I mean, it's in here. It's, it's, it's what it's about. I'm just making it practical. Because now we start, we, instead of just seeking our mission, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm every day, my mission is to be me. And as I love him, when I am loving him, people are drawn to love. Y'all know that. First of all, they're drawn when you love them, but also they're drawn when they see you loving God for real. Not a bunch of checked off my boxes. Well, I've, you know, I have used to be said it, it means you just sin less. It means you don't sin. It ain't about just like sinning less. Well, I, I didn't cuss, but this time this week okay I didn't just I didn't fornicate but this time this month I, I, I didn't steal but I well I kind of did but I didn't really steal it because they didn't really pay me what I'm worth so when I took that extra uh, hammer I needed I, it didn't really okay 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 I'm messing with somebody so the thing is is all of a sudden we get these checklists we think that's somehow oh we justify all kind of stuff can't we that necklace just fell in my purse as I was. They ought to have more sense. They ought to be checking stuff. They just want somebody to shoplift around here. Oh, my Lord, stop it. <laughs> you see, what, what, what happens, we can get focused on the do's and thou's and, and forget really what happens is when I start being who I am and when I start walking and, and it starts coming out of me, I don't want to do those things anymore. He said, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. See, all those years, people took all those messages about thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And all you need to do is tell them, thou shalt walk in the spirit and we're going to have the best church ever could be. 
because the reality is, how are you going to level sin out? The Bible says a man knows to do good and don't do it to him it's sin. Oh, we judge each other and look at judge ourselves. But the reality is, this is higher than that. It's all of a sudden I'm looking to him and I'm walking and I realize that now who I am. I'm not just anybody. I'm a child of the king. I am now, he called us, and I said, if I see him as father, I see myself as child. If I see him as shepherd, I see myself as sheep. If I see him as the bridegroom, I see myself as a bride. But if I see him as king, then I start seeing him, myself as his ambassador. Because now I grew up and I left daddy's house. Now I'm out here working. Now I got something to do. Now he's saying, I prepared some good works for you to do. He said, from the foundation of the earth. Did you know the Bible said that? I'm just, well, I did. Actually, that was in last week's notes. I didn't get to that one. In fact, on the back here, I got Sister Brenda's notes. If y'all missed Wednesday night, you missed something great. And she's going to teach again this Wednesday. But I was writing as fast. That woman talks faster than me. You better get your ears on. If you, Hallelujah. Girl. But anyway, that's my notes from Wednesday night. Y'all need to come around and be on Wednesday nights. But he said, uh, I didn't give you all this, this one, but he said in Colossians 1.10, he said, you might walk worthy of the Lord, all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Oh, I skipped this one. Ephesians 2.10, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Not just do them, it's walking in them. It's a walking it out. There's good works. There's things that you're going to find to do. Like I said, it might be shaking a hand. It might be visiting somebody tomorrow. But he's already got stuff from the beginning. He's already ordained for you that nobody, he didn't ordain it for me. He ordained it for Carol. He ordained it for Kelly. He ordained it. There's things that's been put in. This for you. We're going to talk about some of those things. that he, but we, are, we are to be fruitful, he said. In every good work, he's, we're his workmanship. I, I thought of that little song. I don't know on all the words, but it was, it was, we used to sing it in Sunday school. It said, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the sun and the moon, moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars. John was in Sunday school. <laughs> How good, uh, faithful or something loving he must be. He's still working on me. He could make all that in a day, in a week. But us, he took 59, I'm just told my age, 59 years and he's still working on me. But we're his workmanship. He don't throw away the clay. Even if you become marred, he looked at the vessel in his hands, he saw it was marred. Some of y'all been marred. Man, they dropped you hard. You got cracks all in your vessel. He don't throw you away, say you crack pot. No, he picks you up and he said, he said, I'll make it again. He puts you on the wheel. You think you're going crazy. You're on the wheel. Then he adds some water. Puts his hands around you. Did y'all feel his hands around you today? Brother Art just saw the vision of his hands around us. You're in the middle of his wheel today. You're on the wheel in his wheel. And he's molding and he's making us because he's got purpose and mission in us. We're not here just killing time, paying bills. Now, that's what the world thinks. So, see, we have a message to give the world. And that's what I was really hoping I'm going to get to today. But because uh, in this passage here where I started, where he said we are justified by faith. Uh, he said there we have access to him by faith. Aren't you glad we have access to him? Because of this justification, he said, this is still in Romans 5.1, he says whom we have access by faith and to his grace. I'm so glad today we have access because I want to talk about there was an access that was broken at one time. So I'm going to go over verse 10. This is Ephesians, I mean, excuse me, Romans 5 and 10. While I'm open here, he says, um, we, if we then were enemies, we have been reconciled to God. Because he talks about there that, that how our sin and all these things that started happening. He said, if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we're saved by his life. And I want to talk about that word to be reconciled. Now, how did we get there? I'm going to tell you how. There's a reconciliation that had to happen before I can actually know that I'm his and know my purpose and definitely walk into my mission. 
And so I'm having to go back to this is how we have this access to him and why he's not mad at me and why he's got call on my life and he's working on me and he's not through working on me because there was something from the beginning of time that had to happen. So uh, I'm going to, let me jump from that. I may come back to that area. He said, we've been reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now, uh, I'm going to jump over to 18 in that same ver- deal, 5 and 18. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men into justification of life. I just read you, we've been justified by faith. Now, we have peace with God, right? We have this, we can come in, we can crawl up in daddy's lap. And we can go, if he's king, we can go to the king. We have personal access to him. Because we're his children, and our daddy's also king. So because we have this, he said, but there was something that happened. There was a separation that had happened back, okay? I'm going to do some teaching here. There was a separation that happened way back in the garden where he said, if sin and condemnation entered this world by one man, who was that? Adam. Now, it's funny he said it entered by Adam because it was really Eve that first started, right? Eve actually ate of the fruit first, didn't she? But it's amazing how he never blames Eve. Ever. The only person who blamed Eve was her husband. <laughs> that woman you gave me. Mm-mm. You see, Adam knew, God knows the order he put it, and he knew who had he told Adam. Let me tell you, you need to quit, tell, you need to quit worrying about what God's told somebody else to take care of your own business. We're so worried about what other people are doing. Won't you just take about, if you be focused on between you and God, you won't see all that stuff. Now I'm meddling again. But the truth is, he said he knew because Adam, he told Adam, and Adam, it was Adam's job, it was his positioning. Protect that woman. When she ate of that, he says he was there with her. I always think about what if he'd have said, honey, no, let's go talk to father. Good grief. I know you weren't there when he told us this, but man, we can't eat of that. He, I wonder what had happened if Adam would have stood up. I don't know. But all I know is way down later, he said, because of a judgment, because one person did this, now they have made a decision. Oh, my, I could teach on this forever, but I'm just going to touch on it. They made a decision to walk by their own uh, works, by their own knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so they'd be wise. They could do things on their own. How many of us do that all the time? We want to eat of it. We want to do it our way. That's all they did. They chose to do it their way. And because of that, he said, okay, now you're going to know good and evil. Now you're going to experience both good and evil. Because in the garden, it was only good. Now I'm fixing to have thorns that's going to grow up. I guarantee chiggers came up about that time anyway. But things like that, us Texans know about. I mean, from the depths of the pits of the fire, chiggers and, and all that stuff. I hate them. I don't know. Gary laughs at me because he's like, don't bother me. I'm like, I don't know why, but they like me. But the truth is all this evil started coming and we started experiencing good and evil. We started having these things and we became this place. And I'm going to just tell you this. I don't believe, well, first of all, what happened, this became what the Bible calls a gulf, a space that became between man and God. Oh, let me tell you, when he's in the garden, he said, now I got to get them out of the garden because if I don't let them out of the garden, they'll come back in and they'll eat the tree of life. And what I told them, their consequences won't happen. Because he said, the day you eat of this tree, you're going to become immortal. You're going to start the dying process. You're not going to be this person in here. But there was also another tree, the tree of life. So he says, we're going to block it. We'll make a gulf. They can't come back in the garden. Where in the garden, what did they do? They walked and talked with God personally in the cool of the evening. They had access to him personally access what they lost when they left the garden was access they did not lose their desire as some things will tell you that all of a sudden man became some depraved person who to never seek God that's just not true I'll tell you what happened as soon as they left the garden their two boys Cain and Abel the first thing you find them doing is seeking after God they're giving sacrifices to God (laughs) and God talked to them and they talked to God. They did not lose it where they become some spiritual dead that they cannot hear God and God could not speak to them. I don't care what they say. You find it right there. God told him, said, Abel, why is your brother's, a Cain, why is your brother's blood coming up out of the earth crying? God talked to them. They talked back to him. They had a conversation. They could, God still loved his people. He did not leave them. 
They did not become godless in their world. They had access. They still did. Because then you walk down there, you see Noah who found grace in the eyes of God. Noah lived righteously. You find it over and over. You find Adam. You find, I mean, uh, Abraham. You start seeing people before the cross. They still had a desire to be with God. They just couldn't get to him like that. And finally, he come along and gave Moses all these laws, these things, and said, now I'm going to give you priests. And they'll talk to God for you, and they'll come to And then they still had a go-between. God's always been seeking after his people. He never stopped loving his humanity. Even this is powerful. If one man's offense brought judgment upon all men to condemnation, then even the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and to justification of life. Can you say gift came upon all men? Did it say that he came upon just the little good people? Did it say it just came upon my chosen few? It didn't say that. If one man sinned and everybody became sinners, he said, wouldn't it be fair by one man's obedience, which was who? Jesus, that all became, ooh, it's there. You think it's not, oh, let me keep reading. Is it hot in here? Am I just on fire? I am, I'm not even going to say what's happening, but some of you women over 40 know it's okay. Oh my goodness. Let's just turn over here. I mean, let me just finish there. He goes, for if one man's disobedience, many were made sinners by the obedience of one, many made righteous. Where, where over the law entered and fence my abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. When my sin abounds, oh, it causes me a lot of consequences when I'm out here doing crazy stuff. But you know what he said? Grace more abounds. That don't make sense. When someone does this wrong, we want to get them double trouble. Oh, my goodness. No, he said, he knew, y'all, he knew us. He knows our fallibilities. He, we're, his, we're his. You know how your children are? I don't care how messed up your children are. You'll say, well, you don't know why they're throwing a fit. Because I, I had to leave early this morning. They didn't get their nap out. You know, I didn't even had to, had, had even get to make it to McDonald's yet to give them some of those ungodly chicken nuggets yet. But you know, they're, they're hungry. Oh, you don't know. They have, that, that, don't be judging my child. They have dyslexia. The, don't be judging my child. See, we understand our babies, don't we? He understands you. And not just us. He understands everybody. And he loves. Do you know the Bible did not say in John 3, 16 that God so loved his church that he gave his only begotten son? It's not there. My little elect, my little certain people that I've chose from the family. It doesn't say that. He so loved the world that he gave. There's been a reconciliation happen. I'm going to jump right on over here to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to get to where you'll see the word that I've been talking about because I've been wanting to go here. I just wish everybody was here to hear this because it's so foundational. And um, let's go to 2 Corinthians I'm going to turn over here to the fifth chapter. Um, oh, there's so much in here. I've got half this thing underlined. But we'll jump down here um, in 18. He said, and all things are of God. All things are of God. Now, I'm going to reflect back to a, a scripture that I had read last week. I'm still on last week's, man. It's all right. Um. All things are of God. Okay, so I'm just going to read this in class. He said, for by, him and all, and by, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Y'all remember me reading that? All things were made by him and for him. All things. Little grasshoppers were made by him and for him. Carol just said chiggers. I don't know about that. Because we're supposed to experience good and evil in this way. That's it. Whew, Jesus. Okay. All things were created by him and for him. I mean, he made, he, yeah, he made the universe. We just tap into a little, we don't know what's out there, do we? Is there, is there aliens? I don't know. It could be. 
I don't know. He didn't tell me. It's not my business. I mean, that's, somebody else is worrying about that. Aliens are coming in. I don't know. But all I know is all things were made by him and for him. But you know what I do see? It's powerful. Tell me about this world. Do you see the earth is his crowning glory? Do you see of all, everything he did? Just what we can see? We can see those. They're trying to find even a, some way that earth can be in Mars. I mean, humans can be in Mars, aren't they? None of those places, they can't even find enough oxygen or water. Or there's no, not even a green sprig they can see. But earth? Earth. Not only has it got all the luscious vegetation, but all the magnificent animals and insects, including chiggers. But not only that, but it's got these human beings that actually create things that we can go take pictures of Mars. And send people to the moon. I mean, look at this earth compared to the rest of it. Just what science can see. There's something special about this world. And the people that he created that we want us to look at a little different. He said, all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. There's that word reconcile. We're going to talk about what that means. And has given to us. We're talking about mission now. He did this so we could do this. Has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Whatever that word means. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the what? The world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them what I mean she didn't write it down on their ledger boy that'll mess with you he was in Christ reconciling the world to himself didn't say just the church or his people or the Israelites or the Jews or his selected uh, people that you know that Calvin thinks he chose but, but here but to himself not imputing their trespasses against them and has committed unto who? Us. The word of reconciliation. The word. He first talked about this ministry, which means the service. The ministry is a service of reconciliation. But then he committed a word to us. Now then, we are, what? Ambassadors. For Christ, because of that first part there, we're ambassadors of Christ through God, the, as though God did beseech you by us, Paul's talking, we pray to you in Christ's stead. Instead of Christ, we read this one last week, instead of Christ now, because he said, I give you the ministry of reconciliation. So now I've been beseeching you, I'm beseeching you now. It means I'm calling you, I'm teaching you, I'm calling you. I'm beseeching, I pray in Christ's stead, you be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteous of God in him. Now it says two things. It said, first of all, he's already reconciled the earth to himself. Then he says, he's give us the word of reconciliation that we might be reconciled to God. Well, wait a minute, which is it? Does he done it? What's he done and what needs to be done? That's the question. We need to talk about what he did. He said, I just reconciled the world to me. I made him that knew no sin to be sin for us, that now we could be righteousness. What happened? There was an, there was an exchange right there. Well, it's kind of interesting because if you look up, hit the Greek, bit your little, if you got the little uh, app on your phone that I've got, that I can just mash and see what that really meant. Actually, when you look up the word, the first place it's the word it says about reconciled, it says exchange. There's an exchange made. He took Christ, who was the perfect, lived with no sin, the spotless lamb, and put it in the place of Pam. And put me over here. Not just Pam, but the world. He reconciled the world. He took Christ, who was the one who, because of one man's disobedience, condemnation and sin came. Now Jesus is obedience because he was the perfect one. Now we are all counted righteousness. We now have this access to God as though we were a spotless lamb that can come right into the throne room of God and not be struck by lightning. There's people say, I can't come to that church, Pastor. If I did, I'd be, it'd, be, it'd fall down, I'd be struck by lightning. What they're saying is they have condemnation. They don't understand who they are yet. 
But see right here, he said, in Christ, now I am an ambassador. So let's talk about these. We already talked about an ambassador is. That means somebody that goes instead of somebody. We send ambassadors to Mexico instead of the president or over to Russia or to China or to wherever. In the stead of, of the president, we have ambassadors, right? They go in his stead. That's who we are now. We've been talking about we go in Christ's stead to work tomorrow and we're the hands and feet of Jesus. He's not walking around in sandals anymore. I said it last week. He's walking around in our feet. It's now our hands, our mouth. It's, I'm going to beseech you, as Paul said. We're the ones been calling you. Christ is already going on. The Lord, but now he's in us through the Holy Spirit. We're beseeching you in Christ's stead. But there's a reconciliation. Now, the word that means to be a swap, but let's look at this word. There's more to it. The first word I thought about was reconciliation. I thought about divorces. One of the reasons for divorce, people say they have ear. What, what is it? Irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable differences. That means we have a difference that we just can't work through. We just can't reconcile this. We just can't, rec we can't bring this to a place of evenness. There's not going to be no even exchange here. We just can't get past this one. He did it one too many times. She said it one too many times. They used that, they spent our money one too many They cheated, whatever it is. It's irreconcilable. We can't do it. So they split. There's that word. Brother Art, on Monday night, we were talking about this a little bit at our Monday night group. Brother, Grant, Brother Art says, when I used to own a business, I had an accountant that come in, about, I guess every year, however often, and he said he reconciled the books. The accountant would come in and reconcile my books. Well, what does that mean? It means you took two sets of books. It's like this. You reconcile your checkbook. Now, half of us don't even use checkbooks anymore. It's a check, but the truth is that you reconciled your checkbook. That means you took, once you've seen what you've been writing down, your balance says you have $1,000. Then you get the bank statement and it says you have a negative 100. You know, you're like, wait a minute. We're going to balance the books here. Something ain't right. I forgot to write down a couple of those checks. Gary, did I see, what was that Cabela's bag I saw in there? <laughs> okay. Y'all know Cabela's, okay. Well, it's hunting season. Well, it's not yet, thank God. Well, okay. The thing is, is it's not balancing. You know, come in and reconcile the books and find out where the problem is. There's a deficit somewhere. Something ain't jiving. That's where we were with God. Man, one man's sin. All of our sins and all of our junk and every one of us. But he come in and he reconciled. He balanced the books by exchanging him that knew no sin for those that us. And he exchanged him and he made us reconciled. He brought us together back to God's presence. Now that I can say he's not mad at me. He loves me. I've already settled that. I'm his and he is mine. Now I can get busy going on doing his work. I can get busy loving him, being loved, and then loving other people on his stead, in his stead. Now I can go be an ambassador because he's already reconciled some things. Does that make sense to y'all? This ministry of reconciliation. So now he has reconciled the world. He's already done that. We don't have to die for him. Do Hallelujah. Let me see if i let me finish the scripture here. I may, I may have already read all that. I think I did. Okay, because then he said, I've given you the word of reconciliation. What does that mean? How am I an ambassador going out and giving the word of reconciliation? That word is the gospel. It's the good news. That means now what I do, it's my job. Now that y'all understand, what, hopefully y'all understand what reconcile even means. That you can know that he's already reconciled the world. No matter who I run into in Walmart tomorrow, whoever, I don't care if the sorriest person in your family, you're like, they ain't ever turning to God. Don't ever, don't ever say never. Because you know this, the people with the biggest mask, the biggest pain, and the biggest stuff is usually those that have a heart in there. They are hurting in there. And they're needing the great counselor. They're needing the healer. They need the fruit you have. They need some long suffering represented to God to them if God loves you so um just lost my train of thought hang on let me get a drink of water here he gave us the word That 
means it's now my responsibility as an ambassador to go tell people about reconciliation. I'm to tell them, do you know God loves you? He's already died. Do you know you're his child? You know your father's just waiting for you to accept his love? He got so much good stuff for you. Oh, it's very different concept when you start seeing this, that God has already took care of all the sin. Now, it's my job to go tell you that. It's my job to go tell people the good news, that God's already paid for your sin. All you got to do is come and receive it. All you got to do is come and drink of the water of life. You start speaking to this to people instead of going, do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? Now, I'm not, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying there's a different concept. There's a different look at this to go, it's, you're saying that, but you don't just go around saying like, because that's almost like, you know, are you saved? Are you a heathen? No, you start speaking to, you start speaking to the God in people. He breathed into man. He became a living soul. I believe every single person in this earth has got the same longing to get to God that Cain and Abel did. I believe they have that God hole. I think they're just waiting for somebody to tell them the good news. God's already reconciled you. You've already been reconciled. That means he's already made the, he's already, he's not even imputing your trespasses against you. The Bible said, I just read it to you. So now you just need to come and receive it. You're my brother. You're my sister. I don't wait for them to go, okay, I'm going to repeat a prayer. I'm like, come on. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're, come on, let's go talk to the Father. I'm telling y'all, and by faith they go, wow. When they start believing that, you know what? They receive it. Ooh, some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm telling you, there's a way here to start speaking to people, the God in them. Pull it out of them. It's in there. You just need, you don't know who, who you're talking to. God knows. It's my job. I'm not saying you go tell everybody, okay, you're just all right. I'm not talking about all right. They're not all right because they're lost. They're all right. They're seeking. They want to know, what do you have that I don't have? I'm talking about people who've been in church for years too that are still struggling. They need to see something in me to go, hey, there's more. I don't care if you're out there worshiping Buddha. I'm like, there's more. Oh, come on, babe. You don't, dis- don't disrespect them where they are. The truth is people that's praying to Buddha is seeking something. Good. When I got that, it changed everything. That means they have a heart after God. Oh, you deceive one? Okay, how well, that's going to help them out. You're so deceived. No, just go be the light. Jesus said this. I, I'm going to read it. Well, I'll just jump on to the end. This is so powerful. Oh, my gosh. There's so many here. I haven't even got to here. Oh, let me just, no, I'm going to hold that. Let me just read. Let me show y'all some more. Let's put First John 2, 2 up there. No, no, it's first off. Let's do Colossians 1. Did I just do Colossians? I, I didn't finish it. Okay. Uh, let's go to Colossians 1, 20 and 22. I, I have to stop. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. There's that peace. He has to reconcile all things. Did you get this? is 20. Have we got that up there? First John no, excuse me, I'm getting you real confused. Colossians 1, 20. There you go. Having made peace through the blood of the cross. There's that peace he made. He reconciled everything. He reconciled the books. He got peace right there. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth, heaven, whether you were, because you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he has now has reconciled. It was in your mind, wasn't it? You were alienated and enemies in your mind. But now he in his body of his flesh through his death he presented you holy and unblameable and reprovable in his sight. That's how he sees you. Amen. Because he sees you through the blood of Christ. He sees you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's hard to believe when you're acting crazy. You need to start seeing yourself the way he sees yourself and then you'll start acting like it. It's amazing when you get your, your this, all these things happen. Okay, First uh, John 2, 2. For he is the perpetuation for our sins and not ours only, First John 2, 2, but for the sins of the whole world. It's not just for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Go on down to 1 John 4, 14. He said, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of what? The world. 
John 12, 47, he said, this is Jesus speaking. Those were first John. This is St. John. If any man hears my words and believe not, I don't judge him. I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Guys, this hit me today. If he made all things, if all things were made by him and for him, the universe, Jupiter and Mars, the crickets and the chiggers, and you, if all things were made by him and for him, why would he let the devil have any of them? I'll leave that hanging in the air. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like to his brother that he might be merciful and a high priest faithful high priest in all things pertain to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Did y'all know it was in here this many times? And this is just a few of them. Over and over he tells us he made reconciliation. Colossians 2.14 Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us he nailed it took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Whatever you've done. Do you know when they killed somebody, they took a death sentence, and they do this even today in Texas, that does a lot of death sentence, but they have to read the offense. They don't just go out here and like to keep somebody or give them lethal injection or back there, hang them or, or, or to crucify them. On the cross where they crucified them, they put a paper that said, this is why they're dying. So people walk by and go, ooh, what they do? On that list, it would say they murdered somebody or they raped somebody or they did this or this. It was, listen, it was an ordinances against them. It was a written paper that said, this is what they're guilty of. What would yours look like? Some of y'all would wrap around this block three times. He said, whatever was written in your life and in your past, whatever it was put on that cross and it's already been reconciled. He paid the price. He took your place on the cross. There was an exchange, a reconciliation to say he blotted out. His blood just washed it away. Whatever was written in that book against you, he even said for the world, not imputing their sins against them. I already read you that. Everything God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him. See, what he wants us to do is be his ambassadors and help people believe in him. To believe in the reconciliation. I have a word. I need to tell people. And let me tell you how I think it works. I don't think it's about running out here and just trying to do all this checking off boxes and, and I've got to go reach this person. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to knock every door. And there's nothing wrong with knocking doors. If God tells you do it, do it. But the reality is, if I'm a fruit tree, I believe that wherever I go, the people that are supposed to come into my hand will come into my hand. I don't believe I had to run and chase them down. I believe he takes me to them. And if he has to send me across the sea, he can bring me into their path. Because see, let me just straighten up a couple of things. I've got down here. I want to just touch on this for a second. Um, there's some scriptures in the Bible that indicate, if you don't know the context, it can indicate that God has only chosen certain people to be saved. They're in there. It looks that way. He talks about his elect. He talks about his chosen. He talks about a remnant. And we've talked about this before on Wednesday nights a while back, like last year. But there's a lot of scriptures that people form complete doctrines and religions or, or, or sects of Christianity based upon a thought that God chose certain people before they found each to earth and they're the only ones going to be saved. And they believe that. And there's scriptures that kind of indicate that. And, but they go into this whole thing I'm talking about being an ambassador. And I just want to throw this in. Some of you that won't make, make, make that much difference to you, but really it's, it's a huge concept that I've been on now for some time and I'm definitely not through studying it and I'm, I'm doing writing on it. But Jesus was talking to his disciples uh, at the very last talk he had with them. It's recorded in the, in the 17th chapter of John. It's the same chapter where they had what we call the Lord's Supper. 
is they'd sit around, he'd wash their feet, and they'd, 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 they took the communion, and, and they were fixing to go from there right into the Garden of Gethsemane, and from there they was going to go to the cross. It was his last talk. He gathered his 12, had a very personal dinner with his 12. He had told them, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. People take that scripture and say that means God only chose certain people. No, he chose certain people for certain missions and certain purposes. And he had chosen those 12, handpicked them. And here's the deal. Some of you, you need to really get this. Some of you already know this. But Jesus only talked to the Jews. Did y'all know that? I've only come to the lost house of Israel. Everything Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was to his people, the Jews. Well, I'll just, he, he, I don't even have, he said, go not the way of the Gentiles or nor to the city of the Samaritans, enter not, but go to the lost house of Israel and go preach and say the kingdom of heaven is a hand. He said, his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles. I'm here right now for the Jews. There was a time and place. You had to get history in its right order. You would get real confused about some of the things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll think he's talking to us. You'll say, well, he just chose them. Maybe I'm not one of the chosen. I've had people tell me that. I have somebody that's been out of prison. They tell me, look, I'm just not one of those chosen. They're convinced because somebody last time he's in prison read him scriptures out of context and has, he said, you've been created for evil. Some people have been designed for that. He said, Pastor, I'm never going to change. I'm, this is just who I am. Certain people are called. You know they're called. I'm just not called. I'm one of those fitted for destruction. Taking the word of God out of context which was quoted there about Pharaoh and those things, but they take him, which was under the law. And so he says this night, though, he's talking to his disciples. He's sitting around, and he's, there's a lot in this chapter. It's amazing. Uh, but he says something. Um, well, did I write them down here? Yeah. I'm going to jump around through here. John, the 17th chapter. I'm just going to turn over there a minute and just kind of jump through this. They may not be able to follow me. But he said something really unusual. He said in verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But I pray for them that you have given me, Father, for they are, they are thine. Now, this is Jesus praying to the Father. The first of this verse, this chapter, said, he said, Father, let me just tell you this. This is a prayer. It says, these words spoke Jesus as he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that I may glorify you, blah, blah, blah. He goes all the way down here. He says, but I'm not praying for this world. I'm, I'm not, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for them that you have given me for they are thine. They are thine. Jesus did not pray for the world. I'm only praying for them you've given me for they are thine. Oh, let me show you. This is the kicker. This is, shows our mission here in the middle of this. There's another place, you can hold that there, but in that John, a few chapters back, John 6 and 37, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and them that come to me I will no wise cast out. All the Father's given me have come to me. Another place there he said, All that you've given me, I've lost none of them, Father, in this prayer, except for the son of perdition, that the, the scripture would be fulfilled. Everybody you've given me, I've not lost any of them except Judas because that was prophesied was going to happen. I'm not praying for the whole world today. I'm praying for those you've given me and those you've given me, they've come to me because you gave them to me. Okay, who is he talking about? Romans 9, 27, it says, Elias cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. For if the Lord of Sabbath had not left us a seed, we'd been as Sodom and Gomorrah. We'd all been gone. I know I'm getting you somewhere. Hang with me. Romans 11, 5, 5 says, Even this present time there's a remnant according to the election of grace. What then? Has Israel not obtained what he sought for? No, the election has obtained it and the rest were blinded. Okay, now I'm going to give you the answer. Those he's talking about right there is the Jews. And he said, well, I walked on this earth, these three and a half, well, 33 and a half years. But during his ministry, he said, Father, everybody that was supposed to come to me, you brought them to me. I've walked around this earth and everybody, they came and I've not cast them out and they're, they're here and I've lost none of them. See, I'm going to say, if we're the hands and feet of Jesus, I believe this, I'm going to show you, this applies to us. 
that God has got your life and there's certain people I believe that you are meant, you're going to walk into them. You're going to run into them and you are, you won't lose them because you're going to be looking for them and God's going to bring them into your sphere of influence. That's the ministry of reconciliation. He said, for I am in the world. So are you in the world now? Now, let me finish this part. He said, now, I'm not praying tonight for all of them. I'm only praying for these 12 in this room and those that you've given me. I'm not praying for them. Then he goes on, and this is the scripture that's so powerful that transfers it to us. He says, okay, we're in John 17, and you jump over. That was verse 9. He said, um, verse 20, neither do I pray for these alone. Now he's further continuing his prayer. At that point, he's only praying for the lost house of Israel, those you've given me, the ones that's come to me that I've not lost. They're my personal ministry. Do you know Jesus did not reach the whole world? He stayed with a little, how many miles was it? Just a short mile, little thing. Jesus lived his whole life, walked around. He was very limited. He only talked to certain people certain times that came in his life. There was crowds, there was different people, but he had his life and he reached certain people. Now he says, but now I'm not just going to pray for them. He said, but alone, but this is verse 20, but I'm also going to believe, pray for those that believe on me through their word. He said, I've got 12 sitting here. I'm praying for them. I've done my work, Father. Now they are going to go out and they're going to reach the whole world. He said, now I'm praying for those that are going to come to you through their word, through Tony's word, through Tiffany's word through Shay's word do you see the plan Jesus did his he's a model he walked around he says as I and this was in the first as I am in the world he said as long as I'm in the world I'm the light of the world but when I leave then what happens he said ye are the light of the world now you are the city sit on the hill. And he said, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. He said, my flesh is now laid down. I've set down the right hand. Now my spirit's coming. And through that, you're going to do more works. You're going to do greater works. What does that mean? Pam's going to reach however many in her life. Kelly's going to reach however many in her life. David's going to reach how many in his life. There's greater works because there's more little Jesus that's running around all over the earth. We're ambassadors from the king. We have a mission. I'm to run around and multiply and tell people he's already reconciled you. I'm going to go out and love people to him. To, and I'm not just going to talk it. I'm going to walk it. I'm going to love people. I'm going to be long-suffering. And everybody I see, I'm going to treat them like one of God's children. I don't care your worst enemy. He said, pray for them. You do good for evil. And to, in doing so, you can turn, you'll turn things around. This fire, the, the pure fire and fire of God can come upon them. If you'll do good for evil, we have been given an ambassadorship. I've been told to do something, and this is what I am. I am now, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But the next one says, but now you are in the world, now you are the light of the world. We have got a work to do. This is amazing, and it's not even work. I do it from a place of rest. I just walk around being alive, being the best mama. The sister that told me this, I don't find my purpose. I said, what do you really want to do? She said, I want to stay home and take care of my babies. I said, there is no greater mission and calling in the whole world. You sit at home and take care of your babies. You let your husband take care of things. Let him pay the bills. And if you have to downgrade, whatever you have to do, find the way, sister. Don't tell God it ain't possible. I have to leave my kids. You may not have to leave your kids, but if God calls you to do something, there's nothing going to stop it. You work it out. You say, Lord, I know you've got a purpose and a will, and my main calling is right here. Oh, we get the world's philosophy. Oh, everybody's got to run out. Our, our women don't feel like they're nobody. I remember when I quit, I worked for 25 years. After I was no longer chaplain, Weeby, I got one of my guys. See, I'm, as long as I, after all that, I, 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 first time I answered the phone, and they said, uh, Chaplain Weeby, they go, oh, oh, no, you're not Chaplain Weeby. I don't know what to call you. I'm like, yes, I am Chaplain Weeby. First time I had to put on application unemployed, I'm like, what? Man, I just felt like I lost my identity because I'd wrap my identity about who I was my title. I had to be able to just be Pam. See, this world puts stuff on us. We don't know what we didn't know what this is really about. I'm the light of the world. I'm his ambassador. He reconciled me. He sees me as holy and blameless. He's already got that taken care of. But the issue is, I go on, I didn't read all that. He goes, but if grace abounds, he goes, then should we just continue in sin that grace should abound? 
Oh, do just go on and keep doing what I'm doing. Okay, see how that works for you. He said, no, God forbid. Why would we want to continue in that damaging, crazy lifestyle just because I can? He loves me. I'll go out and do what I, I do. Well, I'm, okay, there I go. Stop doing the gangster walk. Okay, I start acting. No, if that's my attitude, I need to go check and see what's going on in here. No, I need to fall in love with Jesus. Because he said, when you love me, you'll keep my commandments. When you love me, you cannot help but want to go out and serve somebody. You fall in love with Jesus. People come to church with you. Because they go, where do you go to church? Something different about you. I'll tell you what worries me. When you've been sitting in church for years, you see people. You see who brings people to church, don't you? It's usually people who just got saved. I just found this church. Oh, I've been looking for this church all my life. They tell all their friends and family. Look at Eddie. He just fills up the whole section. It's because you're excited. It's because find me grateful. Find me thankful. But what happens, we get real ungrateful and real unthankful and start picking around and we forget what it's all about. And it becomes about me and I become very unfruitful. Not only I'm not having babies, but I ain't got much peace and joy. Because I'm telling you something, if I had some peace and joy and long suffering, goodness, all that kind of stuff, I'd be bringing people. They're going to be following me. I want to go where you go. They follow Jesus. Why? Even if they're coming for the loaves and the fishes, they see loaves and fishes. They see miracles. Let God weed out everything else. You guys that come, you find Monday nights, you tell everybody about Monday nights. Because you found a treasure. When you found this church, it was a treasure. Why are you holding on to the treasure and not willing to talk about it to people? You know why? Because we think it's our responsibility to save them. It's our responsibility. i got to say all this little stuff. You don't say nothing. Just be like the man that was blind. I was blind, but now I see. I don't understand all that stuff, but I know what God did for me. That's being a light. That's being as he is in the world, so am I. He said, now you are in the world Jesus and brother, I think it was Linda, brother Linda quoted it this morning. One of them about the glory. He said, "I've given the Father as you give me the glory now. Now I've had this. And now I'm going to be the glory." He said, now, Jesus, he, "Jesus says, you give it to me, I give it to them." He said, "Neither I pray for these alone, but I pray for those who believe on me through His world. I mean, through His word, the word of reconciliation." He was talking. Those that would come was just particular Jews. I read you the scripture. There was a remnant that was going to be taken out of this side, out of the old law. He said, though Israel's like the sand of the sea. He told Abraham, I'm going to make your seed like the sand of the sea. And they were. He said, but out of that seed, out of all the sand, there's only going to be a handful that's going to keep the heart and keep the main thing, the main thing. They're the ones I'm going to take them. He talks about it in Malachi. Those that spoke often of me, those that love one another. He said, I'm writing their name in a book. He said, the day I make up my jewels, I'm going to get them. That was the Israelites out of the old covenant. The 12 was part of that. And he brought them on this side. And Paul said, I thank God I'm one of the elect. Paul was a Jew. He says, I'm one of those that God elected. He said, because the rest of them, God blinded their eyes. That ain't talking about us on this side of the cross. On this side of the cross, it's whosoever will let them come. On that side of the cross, it was all about the law. There was a chosen people. But even those chosen, he brought them out. He said, I'm going to go back and get them. Do you know that when Jesus died, was in the grave, he said he went back and preached to the spirits that was in the, the place of the dead. And he said, the souls that was in the days of Noah. Do you know that Jesus loved those people that was beating on the side of Noah's ark saying, let me in? Oh, the people that are atheists make God out to be some sadistic God. Oh, your God saves, uh, what is it, eight people and a few animals and everybody else can just go to hell. Everybody else can just, uh, he didn't care about those little innocent babies. Let me tell you something. God has a plan that's bigger than our plan. He destroyed the earth at that time because there was violence in the earth. And boy, I've, I've been seeking it this week. He was purifying the seed. It's all an imagery for us to have today. But even in the imagery, he loved those people. He went back to the first people. He went back to the people in the days of Noah. That's how much God so loves his world. And everybody in it from the beginning to the end, he loves them. I don't know how this all works out. I don't have all the answers. But I can tell you, I'm not missing some scriptures anymore. And I'm not ignoring the truth. 
my God is a God of love and I don't think the devil wins. I think it's God's will that none should perish. I'm telling you, my God is on the throne and I don't know how all this is going to work out, but I know a few things and I know he's already reconciled this world to himself and I'm going to go out and tell him about it. How about y'all? 